feel like I said. Happy 4th of July, you poor <laughs> Canadian kid, Joni. Yeah, yes. But I, oh, and you too, Nicole. But I know Canada Day is coming, right? He's come and gone, dear. It's over. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> well then, belated happy Canada Day. Yes, lucky us, we still get to wear masks on planes and at airports. Oh. Yes, extra special here. <laughs> All right, it is 10 a.m. We are going to begin. Um, as always, we are in for a treat. There's a, um, a, a big and interesting chiddush in this in the sicha, and then it ends up with a extremely embracing and bolstering message to all of us. It's Chukas Gimel in Chelak Yudchas of Lukutei Sichas. Sif Aleph, Isa B'divrei Chazal, our Chazal taught us, it is written in the words of our sages of blessed memory, that the well that gave forth water for the Jews in the desert was, uh, that miracle was in the merit of Miriam. And therefore, take of Achaptiras Miriam, immediately after the passing of Miriam, and we learned, the Torah tells us in our Parsha, that the congregation had no water. And the same source in Tainus, Gemara Tainus tells us, that the clouds of glory were in the merit of Aaron. And when Aaron passed, uh, the, the clouds of glory, uh, they, 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 they went upwards. They also were gone. But Abba Pikain, nevertheless, his skyma habe'er gam la achaptiras Miriam. Nevertheless, we see that the well remained in effect and remained in place after the passing of Miriam. And the clouds of glory existed after the leave taking of Aaron. Ki achar kach chazru shneim bischus meishe. Kehem shechdivir chazal sham. But like the Gemara Tainus tells us there, that both of these um, miracles returned in the merit of Meishar Benu. Ubashkafa Rishayna Nira. At first glance, it appears, Sha'af Rashi, Pepeirusha Yalatera, Lima Pshutshal Mikra, Nakat Kedivri Chazala now, that Rashi too, in his commentary on the Torah, which is about Pshat, the Pshutshal Mikra, he too cited these words from Chazal. And now the Chab is going to tell us where Rashi does that. On the words, and the congregation did not have water in our Parsha. Perish Rashi. Rashi um, explains. Mikan, from here we learn. That all 40 years they had the well in this Chos of Miriam. And on the words, and Knani, the people of Canaan heard, also in our parsha, Kasab Rashi writes, They heard that Aaron passed, and therefore the Anani Hakavi, the clouds of glory, uh, passed upward. On the other hand, we find, that the well existed after Miriam's leave taking from this world, as is written at the uh, later in the Parsha, actually in the sixth part of the Parsha, in the sixth Aliyah, uh, we find we find the miracle concerning Eshed Hanacholim. And uh, spoiler alert, uh, that Rashi is very long, so get, leave a little bit extra time for um, Friday to say your chitas. Um, and there, um, Rashi explains that um, in order for the Jews to pass into the territory, I wanted to read this Rashi off of my phone. I had another device. I tried to make it work. It didn't work. So, um, but basically, to paraphrase Rashi, Rashi says that 
um, the Jews had to pass through a narrow strait. And that narrow strait was in a valley between two mountains. And the way those mountains were configured, on one, on one side, there were clefts, large clefts. And on the other side, there were large protrusions, very much like breasts. And um, the plan was that our enemies were gonna stand in the clefts. And when the Jews would pass through on the narrow strait, they would, they would shoot at them. They would, uh, you know, let go their, their arrows and, and their, their, um, their stones that were like missiles and so on and so forth. But Hashem made an incredibly big nace and he caused the mountains to lean towards each other. Rashi does explain that the mountains were already very close to each other, so much so that if one stood on one mountain, um, you could speak to the person on, a, on the mountain across from you. That's how close they were already. But Hashem made them move into each other and crush our enemies who are waiting in the clefts to ambush us. Okay. Now, why is Rebbe bringing this in? Because Okeperish Rashi al Pasuk. So after this nest, the Jews sang a song, one of 10 songs that were sung, in, well, one of nine songs that were sung in history. And the crescendo song will be sung when Mashiach comes. And in that song, we see it says, Umi Bamba's Hagai, this day Mayaf. And um, <clears throat> Rashi cites, Kisham Mace Mesha Visham Batlahab Air. That is where Moshe passed, and it was there that the well um, ceased to operate. So this means that the well operated for the entire life of Moshe, not just the entire life of Miriam. It came back definitively. Rashi also tells us in that story that the Ebesher wanted, God wanted that the Jews should understand what a great miracle had occurred. And it was the well of Miriam that actually revealed for them the miracle that had occurred because Hashem made that the water of the well should go into that narrow street, into that valley between the two mountains and then flow out, this is a little bit gory. Uh, the water carried the bones and the blood of, of the crushed uh, enemy uh, nations and circulated around the machana of the nation, around the encampment of the Jews so that they were able to see what Hashem had actually done for them. Um, so this is all to say that the be'er, the, the, the well came back and it did exist and it held a very important place. So from this it's understood, Shalashitas Rashi, in Rashi's opinion, in Rashi's way of understanding, Hashem returned the Be'er in the Swiss of Moshe. So therefore, it stands to reason that the clouds of glory also returned in the Swiss of Moshe. Now it says, because it's not really a logical opinion to say that the schus of Moshe was enough to bring back the well, but not enough to bring back the clouds of glory. But if you learn in accordance with this understanding, it according to this, however, there is something that is kind of flabbergasting. The story about the return of the well is written very explicitly in the Torah. The, the nation had no water. They enmassed upon Moshe. They gathered against Moshe. They, they, they actually fought with him and God commanded Moshe to take his stick and through this to return the water from the rock to the Jewish people. This was the return of the well. Masha ain't came, but a contradistinction, but a gala, none have covered, ain't called Sion. Loy because of Afloy be perish Rashi, the Aza Eifen, the Amasai Chazru. But when it comes to the clouds of glory, we have no. Um, delineation. There is nothing explicitly written, not in the actual verses and not in Rashi's commentary as to how the clouds of glory were returned and when they returned. So 
there has to be kind of a correlation between these two nisim. And yet they're treated very differently in the Torah and also in Rashi's commentary. So about the Be'er, we know exactly how and when it was returned to the Jews. And about the, the clouds of glory, it's silent. The Rebbe says, that's my first question. But we also have to understand. In the same way that the um, <clears throat> dissipating of the well after the death of Miriam caused the Jews to gather and mass against Moshe and to actually fight against him. The, the dissipation of the clouds of glory after the death of Aaron should have caused a similar outcry. It should have caused a similar reaction. The case of this, how is it? So how is it that we don't see that the Jews came to complain against Moshe when they lost Ananiya Kavit? Now we know it can't be because they were too polite to complain. And uh, you know, it, we know it can't be because they 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 didn't notice, because as we'll soon see that Ananiya Kavit were ubiquitous in their lives and served many, many purposes. So how could it be that they lost something so important and so integral to their experience in the desert and yet no peeps? Beis. Perhaps we might have been able to explain this. Maybe we could explain that according to the simple understanding, the clouds of glory did not return after Aaron passing. And the reason for this is simple. They didn't return and they didn't cause an outcry because the Jews didn't need the Ananiya Kavit anymore. Why would you say that? Because Rashi has already explained earlier. That the Ananiya Kavit, the clouds of glory, embraced and surrounded the Jews on, in four directions. And then there was one cloud of glory above them and one below them. And through this, the clouds served four purposes. Number one, they protected the Jews so that they would not be smitten, they would not be harmed by the scorching heat and the sun. Bays. The second purpose that they served, like Rashi has explained above, they scrubbed their clothing and they ironed their clothing. And then there was another cloud. So this would be the seventh cloud that went before them. And what did that cloud do? It basically served as their navigator, their GPS. It led, it led their way. The chain and the other thing that the seventh cloud did, the fourth thing that in the aggregate these clouds did was the yashar haderech olahagim min hamazikim. It smoothed their way. And it, it, again, also protected them from people that might harm them. And in the words of Rashi in Baha'u'llah, man mich es ha it flattened the elevated um, plains, umagbias han namoch, and it elevated the low, like kind of the, the places where it went down, like a valley. Um, this would be like a great thing for the streets of Crown Heights, some kind of cloud that could flatten it and make it safer for older people to walk, but I digress. And in addition, and it also killed uh, snakes and scorpions. So this would be a hard thing for the Jews to miss. Uh, you know, the, these clouds were serving a lot of different purposes. Amnam, however, but after Aaron passed, you could, you might be able to say that B'nai Israel did not need all of these um, actions that these these clouds were able to um, 
provide for them. Why? Because Har Har, which is where Aaron passed and was buried, is found already on the very precipice of Eretz Eden. At the very end of the desert. It's found very much near settled places. And so as you leave the desert and you come already to the um, settled parts of that territory, the, the heat, the scorching heat of the sun is not as strong. So you might be able to explain that they didn't need the cloud for that purpose. The and the Rebbe, the Rebbe also says it's not just that because they had already arrived at that geographic location, they didn't need the, the cloud for the purpose of protecting them from the sun, but also because of what time of the year it was. It was Rosh of. Now, Chaydesh of, Samuch Le'ez He Chalesh HaChem. And Chaydesh of is when the sun starts to weaken in its intensity. Shekane, because we see, as it's written in the Gemara Tainis, from the 15th day of Av, and further, the, um, the, the intensity, the strength of the, of the sun begins to weaken. The Ains of Bastir Le Parish Rashi Parshas Noyach, and the Rebbe now goes on a little bit of tension. He says, This is not a contra contradiction to what Rashi says in Parshas Noyach on the word Chaim, heat. Rashi says, Pirushai, the explanation of the word Chaim is Soif Yemaisa Chama, that this is um, a reference to the end of the days of the sun. Which is Chatsi of the Elo, the Chatsi Tishrei. That Chaim actually references the second part of Av and Elo and half of the month of Tishrei, Sha Oilam Chum Biyoiser, because during that time the world is extremely hot. And then it's explained, Shaloi Kaita Kashimi Kaita that the end of the summer is stronger than the rest of the summer. The Hatan, Shamhu, why is that? The reason for this is Kemosh Diek Rashi Boshone, as Rashi cites explicitly in his explanation, Sheha Oilam Cham He doesn't say that the sun is stronger than ever. He says the world is hotter. The reason is because there is a cumulative effect of all of the heat that has been unleashed by the sun in the summer that was right before that. But the actual intensity of the heat that's coming from the sun at that time, Nechalash begins to weaken from the 15th day of the month of Av and going further. And we see this practically. So why is this important to our discussion? And in our discussion here, I'm sorry, because until Aaron passed, of the, there was still the, the, the cloud that protected them from the sun. And it was until that time that the sun is at its intensity. So this explanation, So what Rashi explains in Parshas Noyach on, in a regular time, not when you have the clouds of glory that are protecting you, but in a regular time, the fact that the world heats up and there's a cumulative effect and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And we feel this heat until the first half of Tishrei actually, that wasn't in effect because the cloud of glory was still protecting the world from the sun. And two weeks later, we just learned, by the time it's Chamisha Asr Ba'av, 
the, the, the strength of the sun begins to weaken. This is all to explain the first thing that the Jews didn't need the clouds for, which was they did not need the clouds to protect them from the sun. And in like fashion, and so they also didn't need the cloud. And now the Rebbe is going to go through the other things that the cloud did for them and why they no longer needed it to the same extent that they would have needed it during Aaron's lifetime. Aleph. For the purpose of scrubbing their clothing and ironing their clothing, clothing. I'm sorry. That one of the needs that happened is that their clothing didn't get smaller. But the Rebbe says, but if at this point after Aaron's death let's say a Jew would have experienced a situation where their clothes became small on them. So at this point, they could already buy clothing from one of the cities of the nations that live close to where they were now in their journey. So this was another thing that the clouds of glory did but you will see later that it's not Mamish, the clouds of glory did this, but this was another miracle that's a mention when we talk about the clouds, the fact that their, their clothing was, was able to fit them. And the Rebbe is soon going to explain exactly how that occurred. But right now he's saying that if their clothes became too small on them, now that they're at really the edge of the desert, there are, there are places where they can go shopping, base. And they didn't absolutely need the clouds as a navigator to guide them in their travels. Because now they were already in a place where they already conquered um, roads or thoroughfares. And they, like in like fashion, did not need these clouds anymore to kill the <clears throat> snakes and the scorpions because they were already in, in settled territory. And so the snakes and the scorpions, uh, you know, are not uh, prevalent in, in, you know, in a place where people live like they are in the desert. Okay, so what about the fact that you need the clouds to flatten the, you know, the plain for them, to make the mountains flat and to make the valleys higher. Like Rashi says on the words har har har, which was the mountain where Aaron was buried. That although the, the um, cloud of glory went before them, and would flatten the mountains, but there were three mountains that were not flattened by the clouds. The Har Nevoi, the Taurus Maisha. And the last one was Har Nevoi, which is where, no, I'm sorry, not, not the last one, but one of them is Har Nevoi, which is where Maisha was buried. So it would appear from this, it would seem, that this, this cloud did operate after Aaron's passing, because they have to operate and still not flatten where Moshe was going to be buried. It was still operating when the Jews came to where Moshe passed and was buried. Now the Rebbe says, how are we going to reconcile this? If we say that the, that the, the, the um, clouds are no longer in in effect, how are we going to reconcile this with, it appears that it is still operating even until Moshe is passing. The Rebbe says we might be able to reconcile this. True, it's a little bit of a stretch, but we might be able to say that this miracle of one of the clouds of glory flattening the plane for them 
except for the three mountains, including Har Nevoi, where Moshe was buried, Al Yedei Ha'anan, through the, the cloud, Ira, so this happened, that this effect of the cloud happened, Loi Bishash it didn't happen when the Jews came to Har Nevoi. But from the beginning, this cloud was always three days ahead of them. It was always smoothing out the way for them in anticipation of their coming that way. So it went, this mountain went, and not the mountain, sorry, the, the cloud, went before them, before Aram passed, it went to smooth the, the, the terrain for them for where they would go in the future, but not that it actually was operating after Aaron's death, but it did its work before Aaron's death. The Alpiz, the Rebbe says, and if you embrace this way of understanding, now we can better understand, now it makes more sense, the order in which Rashi cites the three mountains that were not flattened by the Anan HaKavay, by the clouds of glory. Rashi cites three mountains, Har Sinai, famous, Har Nivoi, the mountain where Moshe was buried, when Moshe passed and was buried, the Har Har, the mountain where Aaron was buried. Dilachayr, it would seem. Lafi say the Hamurais. If you're going to go in chronological order, Hayalai Lichtev Har Nivoi after Harahar. Moshe passed after Aaron. So Rashi should have cited first Harahar and then Har Nivoi. But Al Pi Hanal Efsha Hayalavair. But in accordance to what the Rebbe has just explained, which might be a theory, we could say the possession hit him as Har Nivoi la Harahar. Ramas Rashi, by putting Har Nevoi before Har Hahar, which is not the chronological order of how the Jews meet these mountains, Rashi is hinting Shema Shahanan Haitir as Har Nevoi the first Mesha. The fact that the, that the mountain left out Har Nevoi from being flattened for the purpose of Mesha being buried. It was not when the Jews actually reached that mountain, but it was done earlier in anticipation at the same time that that mountain was left for the burial of Aaron. After making such an airtight case for saying that they didn't need the mount, the um, the anonym. They didn't need the clouds after Aaron passed. In Seif Gimel, the Rebbe comes back at us and says, "Ah, ah, ah, avol be'emes." But in truth, the hechrech loimar. We are forced to say, "Shanani akavish chazru lelavois is bnei Yisrael gam achar petiras Aaron." We're forced to say that the clouds of glory return to accompany the Jews after Aaron's passing. And why is this the case? Umikama time. The Rebbe says for a few reasons. Aleph, the pashtos, just simply speaking, lan choysam haderach. If we talk about the purpose of the clouds, that it was for the purpose of showing them the way, navigating, ein perusha rak lishmar mepnei te'iya b'midbar. This doesn't mean that the cloud was only so that they would not wander off, meander off the beaten path in the desert, because there are no marked roads in the desert. But the Rebbe says it's not just for that purpose. But it was for the purpose of showing them in which direction they should travel upon the explicit direction of Hashem. The cave on Shagam La Achar Mises Aaron Hayukama Vachama Masois. And because after Aaron passed, there were still uh, journeys that they undertook. So they also needed the navigator for afterwards. Now you might be asking, wait a minute, didn't you just tell us that after Aaron passed, they already came 
to a settled place. They were already at the edge of the desert. They were finished with the desert, no? So in Bayes, Rashi says, Rashi cause of this Eirosh. Rashi tells us explicitly, Sha'achar Mises Aaron, after Aaron passed, Chazluru la'achay rehem derech yamsuf sheva masais. They actually backtracked in the direction of the yamsuf. And they actually undertook seven more journeys. This means they went back into the desert after Aaron passed. Gimel. So that's that's two reasons why we have to say that is, well, the second bolsters the first, that they still needed the, the clouds to navigate them. Gimel. We know that these clouds also protected the Jews, not just from the scorching heat, not just from the snakes and scorpions, but also in their um, wars with their enemies. And like Rashi has already explained regarding the Muhammad that they did with the Amalekim, that the explanation of the words come out and, and do battle with Amalek, who say, go out from within the cloud and do battle. The Mizem move on. From this we understand, for the entire time that B'nai Yisrael were embraced and surrounded by the clouds, the other nation had shum shlita lilachim lahem. Imam, sorry. They had absolutely no ability. They had no authority to do battle with them. The chain perish Rashi le'il, and Rashi cites this above. Shahayu mitrim, zorikim chitzim, va'avne blistarius, that the Egyptians um, threw arrows and stone missiles at the Jews, va'anon mikatlam, and the cloud of glory, uh, in, you know, was like their um, uh, um, what the, the uh, shield shield yeah 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 but but um, what is what is Israel the what is Israel have the uh, Iron Dome so it was like that that's what the cloud was like Umi Tamza and so for this reason he they take of Acha Misus Aaron as soon as Aaron passed by Yishma Knani the Torah tells us the Knani heard that Aaron passed. And they came to do battle against the Jews. Uperish Rashi. And now let's look at this Rashi carefully because the Rebbe is going to parse the exact words of this Rashi. Sheber when the Kananim saw that the um, the clouds of glory left, so they thought they thought that now they were given permission to do battle with the Jews. So again, the Rebbe says, so this means that the Jews, after Aaron's passing, still needed the clouds of glory to protect them from the future battles they still had to wage. Dalit. The, the effect and the... Um, the efficacy of, of, the, of the cloud of glory in their 42 travels was not just to navigate in which direction they should go. It was also to tell them the exact moment that they should encamp and the exact moment that they should pack up and travel again. Like the like the Torah tells us in Great Lent, the Parsha Balaiska, that it was Alpi Hashem Yachanu, Alpi Hashem Yiso, Vidavar Zen Nitzach B'Chol Hamasayis Adak Nisla Eretz Yisrael. So it would seem that they would again need the cloud until they actually enter Eretz Yisrael. The fact that after Aaron's death they were already closer to their goal, the Rebbe is saying, is still not enough. Because it was the cloud of glory that told them exactly when it was time to rest, when it was time to travel forward. Hey, the ikar, and the main thing, the parshas bolok, achar misas arain. 
In Parshas Bolok, after Aaron has definitively passed, they have a pasuk that tells us that they were hung, Hashem hung them opposite the, the sun. Perish Rashi. Rashi explains on this very kind of interesting and cryptic pasuk, Hashemesh es the sun actually served the purpose of identifying who it was amongst the Jews that sinned. How did this happen? Ha'anon nikpal, the cloud folded up, mikinegdoi, from opposite this particular person, v'achama zarachas alav. It was kind of like a laser beam. And the sun shone on the sinner. Harisha kas of Rashi beferus. This means that Rashi is writing explicitly, that the cloud existed after Aaron's death and protected them from the sun. It seems in more ways than one. So now our question has come back again in its full strength. Why is there no mention in the Torah of the return of the Nanei HaKavit when the Rebbe has proven conclusively that it was still in existence? And the Torah also doesn't tell, them, tell us when it came back and how it came back. It's not found anywhere. And why did the dissipation of these clouds not cause an uproar on the part of Bnei Yisrael. So the Rebbe is reviewing his original questions. So he took us on a scenic route and he showed us that maybe, maybe we could say that they didn't need these clouds anymore. And then he said, not, not, not so much. <laughs> it really doesn't hold water. And, and he brings us all these proofs, including an explicit reference in Rashi himself that the cloud is still in existence. Rashi. We will understand this by prefacing, by looking very carefully at a detail and um, a way in which we find two different terms in Rashi's Perush Alatayra, Al Dvar Hananim. So regarding these clouds, we find the usage of two different terms in Rashi. In a number of places, they are called the clouds of glory. But in some places, they're simply called the clouds. I don't know about anybody else. Maybe I'm, I just never, ever, ever, ever noticed this. You know what? I'm thinking it's like, the Rebbe was like that, you know, the, the, the sun that, you know, like we just read Haika, uh, that the, that the sun identified the sinners, like the Rebbe identified the truth about everything. It was like, he was like the sun that was unleashed, like a laser beam on everything. Um, so the Rebbe says there, there are two terms that Rashi uses. And we find in like fashion, in the Midrashim of Chazal, we find also two terms, Shebehem Isa Shahayu Shiva Ananim. In the Midrashim, the talk about the fact that there were seven clouds, we find two terms. In some of the places where the Midrash speaks about the seven clouds, it says there were seven clouds. But in some places, it says Shiva Anani Kavayu Hayu. It says there were seven clouds of glory. The Rashi, the Perush Elatera, and Rashi in his Perush on the Torah, Nakat Halashin Shiva Anonim Suvim. But Rashi cites there were seven clouds, that it says there were seven clouds. And so, of course, in the Rebbe's intense humility, he says, we might say that the explanation is as follows. What's the difference between calling them simply clouds and calling them clouds of glory? It's simple. 
When you say clouds of glory, I knew this means exactly what the words mean. That the entire reason for these clouds are to show honor to the Jews. This is to say, there were certain clouds that were in place to protect the Jews and to fulfill their needs, their absolutely integral needs. But since these clouds serve these purposes, so ipso facto, we see how beloved the Jews are and how, and this is honorific for the Jews. But separate and apart from these clouds, there were other clouds. The other clouds did not serve any utilitarian purpose. They were simply an honor guard. To showcase for all the great honor that Hashem is showing B'nai Yisrael. And from this is understood. Not all the clouds were created equal. They were not all clouds of glory. The cloud that, you know, flattened and evened out the terrain and also served the purpose of killing the snakes and the scorpions. That wasn't a cloud of glory. Its purpose was necessary in order to facilitate their traversing the desert to make it possible. And in like fashion, the cloud that protected them from the heat of the sun and from the other nations of the world when they did battle. This was not only for the honor of the Jews, but rather it was to provide necessary services to them. So if you were to go back and now read all the Rashis in all the places where it talks about the, the, the different clouds, in those places where Rashi is talking about a cloud that served a practical purpose, he only calls it Anan, he calls it a cloud. And in the brackets, the Rebbe actually goes through them. Ledugma, for example, it say Hilachim ba Malik. Rashi says same min ha'anan. When it said when when the Torah says go and do battle with a Malik, Rashi says take leave from within the cloud. Zarkim chitzim ba anan mekablam. So it says ha'anan mekablam. The nations were throwing arrows and. The cloud accepted them. Har ha har. When it comes to har ha har, where Aaron was buried, it says even though the the cloud went before them and flattened all the mountains, but there were three mountains that it did not flatten. But again, all ha Neged hashemesh. When the Torah says neged hashemesh, Rashi says ha'anan. The cloud, but it doesn't say Anan Hakavit. Anan Nikpal, the cloud um, folded, and the sun was able to shine on the sinner. <clears throat> and finally, when it says that Amalek attacked the stragglers, the last people in the stragglers in the Jewish camp, Rashi explains, Shahaya Anan Poyltan. Who are these people? These were people that the cloud had expelled or repelled from within. So they were they were sinners. Rifkin, That's, yes. Sorry. I have a question. This idea that there were two different types of Vananim and the Reb is pointing it out. Is this, was this, is this common knowledge? Like when the Midrashim wrote it, when the, you know, the Tzaddikim who wrote the Midrash wrote it, 
did they intend to describe two types of clouds or is the Rebbe now taking all of their work and all of Rashi's work and seeing that there were actually two Anan and Anan covered? Sarah, brilliant question. Question that you could ask about every single time you learn a Sikha. Like, did Rashi really have in mind all the things that Rebbe tells us Rashi's teaching us? Did the Rabbah, I mean, like, I don't know how to answer that except to say we are mad privileged. Are there and other are there other Makaris that say that there were two types of Anana? Like, is it anywhere else? Like to the best of the no, of the knowledge of the people I asked exactly this question. This is a huge chiddush. <laughs> but 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 what here's I mean, who might say anything? But maybe this is even the biggest chiddush of all the chiddushim that that the Rebbe makes it like it's right there. Like, it's not my How did no one else see it? It's like, not it's my like it. <laughs> um, it, it, it. In a way, it's like reminiscent of the Tanya, that al Rebbe, like, he makes like, I'm not teaching you anything new. Like, here, like, it's right there. It's right there. And he brings like, the Makaris, he brings the proofs, he brings the words from the Torah, he's able... <sighs> you know, it's like using an MRI, you know? Uh, like... So that's all the places where the terror is talking about the, the clouds and their practical purposes. Masha Ankin and contradistinction, the Indian Hanunim Shinastalku Achamisis Aaron, but when you're talking about the clouds that dissipated after Aaron's passing, Lashin Rashihi. So now you go back and you see carefully what does Rashi say? Nistalku Anane. Kavoid, and the Rebbe says in parentheses, rock. Now, when you look carefully what Rashi says, Rashi says that the Anane Kavoid Nistalku, that it was the clouds of glory that dissipated. This means only the clouds of glory, but not the clouds that the Jews needed for practical purposes, which would explain why there was no outcry on their part. I knew this means. It was only the honor guard um, clouds. But not the clouds that satisfied the needs of the Jews. So now it appears that according to Pshut Mikra, in fact, the Anane HaKavoyed, the clouds that served the very specific purpose of only providing honor and glory to the Jews. In fact, they did never return. Now we understand why the Jews were not upset, why they didn't lead another rebellion, another insurrection against Maisha. Where, where, where's our dry cleaners? And 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 you know, and where's our our protective agent and our iron dome and so on and so forth. Because that never left them. And this is so interesting. The Rebbe says, and now in brackets, the Rebbe says, tangentially, we can also now resolve a question that the aim has. If we learn, the Gemara tells us that the clouds of glory surrounded the Jews in four directions, and then one on top of them and one below them. We're always taught that the sukkah that we build is in the same configuration as the Anani HaKavit. Kamesha Perish Rashi, like Rashi says, keep the sukkahs he shafti. On the words, I, I sat you in sukkahs, Rashi says, Anani HaKavit. These were the honor guards. So then the aim says that when we build a sukkah, we should build a sukkah with four walls and then a wall on top and a wall beneath. But in fact, the halacha is that it's enough to build a sukkah with two complete walls. And the third doesn't even have to be a complete wall. It simply has to be a tefach. 
And the Rebbe says, before I resolve the question, the we could we could add we could add to the Reim's question. Why don't we do anything to recognize and recall the seventh cloud that went before them? But the Rebbe says, but according to what we just learned, this is all resolved. When we build a sukkah, we are remembering the anane kavoid. We are remembering only the clouds that were for the purpose of giving the Jews honor. We're remembering only the clouds that were for the purpose of just the Jews covered. But the cloud that went before them, and in like fashion, some of the other six clouds, they, they also serve the purpose of um, satisfying the needs of B'nai Israel. And we're not recalling that when we build a sukkah. Therefore, the halacha is, it's enough, two and a half walls. Not even a half. Umamela, and therefore, gam mispar dafne sasuka in a shaykh mispar nane kavit. So, therefore, the amount of walls that you have to have a sukkah doesn't have to correlate to the amount of anane kavit that there were. Ubifrachi, shlemishahi, you possess shinuyim. And especially because we might say that the number of clouds actually differ depending on the situation of the Jews. That when they travel, and for whatever reason, they didn't need to be protected on a certain direction. So at that time, when they were traveling in a certain direction, a cloud that would normally protect them would flank them, let's say, on the right. But since they did, for whatever reason, they didn't have to be protected on the right, then that cloud would become an honor guard. Can, uh, can I ask something? Just to clarify, sure. just so I understand yes. something. Yeah, yeah, wait. There's no see if I can, see, can I see you? Are you, can I see your face or it's like this body? It's okay, let me, let me. Okay, there's okay. Six, I'm on there's a phone. Seven so I can't see anything. Oh. There's still seven clouds, right? Yeah. Some yeah. are on an a COVID and some are on an a protection. The number or, doesn't or, or other purposes, dry cleaning or whatever. But it's still just seven. Some yeah. like this, some like this. Correct. Okay, I just wanted to, I don't know if I missed it somewhere, but I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hey, see if hey. Al Pize Yuvan Gam Diuk the Perish Rashi Hanal said Gimel Alva Yishmak Nani. Now the Rebbe circles back to something he mentioned in the third part of the Sikha. He says, now we could understand what Rashi is saying on the words of Ayishma Knani, that the Knani heard. And what does Rashi say? The Rebbe cites again, that the clouds of glory dissipated. And they thought that now this means, this is a signal that they have permission Rashi says that they have permission to do battle with the Jews. It would seem. If Rashi is already commenting, it would seem that Rashi should have included the main thing. That now they were given the possibility and the permission to be Yisrael. But Rashi doesn't say they were now given the possibility, just that this was a signal to Knani. They thought they have permission. Why should Rashi have written F Sharias? Because until now, the Jews, until Aaron passed away, the Jews were safely ensconced from all sides in the Ananiya covered, and there was no possibility. Valpia now move on, but now, based on everything the Rebbe taught us, we understand. Even after the clouds of glory dissipated. Even after the clouds of glory left them, there was still the cloud that was there to protect them from the other nations during a time of war. Except that the Canaanites thought, 
that after the clouds of glory dissipated, what's so fascinating about this is that over and over we see how in tune the other nations were with the spiritual status of the Jews. It's something which um, is a different paradigm from today. You know, we don't, we don't think that like the other nations are taking our spiritual temperature, which may or may not be true. But in, but in the Torah, we see that they were always very cognizant of what was going on for B'nai Yisrael. So they thought that after Hashem is not showing B'nai Yisrael the same level of respect, so this is a proof that they have permission to do battle with the Jews. But regarding the possibility of actually being successful, nothing changed. The A and now you might ask that if they don't think they have a possibility of succeeding, why would this even be in their thought process? The Rebbe says, I know you're thinking, why would the, the Knani go up against the Jews when they realize that the Iron Dome cloud is still in place? The Rebbe says, yeah, you're right. In this regard, you could see that their chutzpah brought them to folly. Until they actually thought that the Jews are going to leave the safety of the clouds and they're going to go out to engage in war. <coughs> and this is especially true in accordance with what Rashi commented earlier, that when the terrorist says Kanani here, it's actually a reference to Amalek. And what do we know about Amalek? And the chutzpah of Amalek is Ein Lashar. You could never even describe the great levels of chutzpah that, that Amalek had. That they ran after Hanecha Sholem Acharecha, those that were straggling after you, Sha'an and Polten, those that were repelled and expelled by the by the cloud, the stragglers. Rashi explains that even when all the other nations were afraid to do battle with the Jews, Kafat Yarad, Amalek jumped to go down in war against Bnei Yisrael. Like Rashi uses that very, very um, graphic a metaphor that is like a bathtub that is scorching hot, but the first person that jumps in, they cool it down for everybody. That was Amalek. Even though Amalek got burnt by being that first person in the bathtub, they went in. The came. So now we shouldn't ask the question about the Kananim, which are really a reference to Amalek, <clears throat> that they would jump upon the Jews as soon as they heard that Aaron passed, even though the protective Anon is still in place. Because the honor guard Anon has dissipated and now they feel that they have permission to attack. But, Ella, <coughs> Now we still have to address a difficulty that arises about another thing that Rashi told us about the Anani Kavod as opposed to the Stam Ananim. And that is, Shanani Kavod Hayush Safim Bichsusam Omegahatsim Oisam. That it was the clouds of glory that scrubbed their clothing <coughs> and ironed them. Va'av Katneim Kamesha Hayugadelim Hayagadal Vushan Imahim. And that, what about the young children? Young adults, we understand. Hopefully, they stay the same size. But what about, haha, right? But what about the small kids that when they grow, so Rashi cites that the, the clothing will grow with them? So 
So now with this new explanation that there are two kinds of Ananim, and that Rashi is very explicit in how he references them. So now how do we resolve that in one place, Rashi does use the term Anane Kavoit, and he says that amongst the many things that the clouds did was that they scrubbed the clothing, they ironed the clothing, and Rashi says, and in addition, the young ones, the clothing grew with them. Ulech it would seem that these are begeder tzarchi b'nei adam, that these are necessary needs. Ve'enam inyan shall kavoid lachud, and it's not just about glory. But the Rebbe says, about be'emes loy kashya midei. And in truth, this is not a strong enough question. Why? Ki bepashkos, because simply speaking, divri Rashi, when Rashi says, ba'av katneim ha'yagadol, the bush and imayim, and for the for the young ones, their clothing grew with them. Einam amurim behem shechol biyachas l'fulas ananei akavit. Rashi is not saying this in reference to ananei akavit. Shari mali in his eshagot al bush and imayim la ananei akavit, because what's the connection between the fact that the clothes grew with them and the clouds of glory? It's only ella shebetayich pirushe al dvar halavushim seeing Rashi sheira behem neis nifra that when Rashi comments on the Nisim that occurred because of the cloud, and we still have to go back to resolve that, right? Because it would seem that scrubbing clothing and ironing them, it, you know, falls in the category of necessity, maybe. But we'll go back to that. But first, Rashi, as the Rebbe is pointing out, when Rashi cites this additional teaching about how their clothing grew with them, Shagadla Imahim, the dovers that in a shechlin la nanim. This has no connection to that nanim. Ella lugufon. It's rather that the clothing grew. Kemay shekas of Rashi sham kilvush hazesh shel choymei shegadal imay. Rashi explains that the clothing grew with them, like the outside of a snail grows with the snail when it grows. But the Rebbe is explaining that Rashi brings it in here because once he's talking about the miracles that occur with their clothing, Rashi also cites another miracle that's not as a result of what the cloud did, but as a result of a miraculous um, nature that Hashem accorded to the bodies of the little children of the Jews that their clothing grew with them. You know, uh, I'm sure a lot of people who have young children would that this would be a very helpful um, indeed. Uh, why does Rashi bring this in um, that same place where he brings about that the Anane covered, uh, scrubbed the clothing, etc.? Because he wants to address a question that can arise here. It's one thing you're talking about. I think it's, yeah, I think I, I, I always have trouble if it's Bishalma. I think it's Bishle Magdalen. It's one thing you're talking about the adults. How you be them the shirt, They could stay in the same clothing, the same, the same size. The Torah says that your clothing did not become too small on you. Aval Kate said, but how can young children remain in the same clothing? When it's the nature of young children to get to grow. Therefore, Rashi brings down this separate mess that Hashem made that their clothing grew with them like the outside of the snail, like, 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 like the hard part of a snail. That's only, if the adults, that's only if the adults didn't get fatter. Well, it looks like the man was a very, very uh, miraculous kind of food. And among them, it kept you, it kept you the same size. Okay. Another thing we could use today. Right. <laughs> and that the anane covered. So now we have to resolve. We said anane covered are only an honor guard. So, but here Rashi is saying that they also scrub the clothing and they, they ironed them. 
another thing we could use. But the Rebbe says, Loi haya hechrach, the Pnei Shagam Luleyan and Ekabad Yuchu Bnei Yisrael, but Midra Lase Shipo Vigyot Zbaif Aravel. This is not like the other things that the that the clouds did, because this was not necessary. Yes, it was necessary to kill the snakes and scorpions, or a lot of Jews would have died in that way. Yes, it was necessary to flatten the terrain; otherwise, it would have been impossible. You know, they didn't they didn't have jeeps. Uh, yes, it was necessary to repel um, the the overtures of the nations, but this was a complete luxury. That their clothes should be scrubbed and 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 ironed, and just like the Torah tells us, their clothing did not become small. They could have found new clothing, so the nest that their clothing never got small on them was also a, a luxury, extraneous. How could they have had? New clothing without the Abisha making that the clothing shouldn't become small on them. The Rebbe gives a few, a few options. Could have been from the proliferation of garments they took out with them from, from Mitzrayim. Or they could have made new garments from all the wool from their flock. That they had from their flock. Or from time to time, when they came close to a settled place where, where there were other nations, they could have bought new clothing. The cave bunch of Indians, Eshanane, Kavi, Dafka, Hinshahayu, Safim, Makitim. But the terror tells us that Anane, Kavi, Dafka, that was how their clothing was scrubbed and ironed. Hayalai, Inin, Hachrachi, Livne, Yisrael. This was not a necessary thing. Elara, Kide, Lachsach, Mehem, Tircha, Kala. It was only to take off from them. Uh, a slight inconvenience. Hareze gufa amitas ha inin decovered. That is the quintessential way of showing respect. When you seek to take off from someone even a slight inconvenience. Ad kama miyakar kadosh baruchu mechabez b'nei Yisrael. This shows us how much Hashem cherishes and loves us and honors us. And therefore, it is shayach tanane covered and not anan stam. Zayin. Vadayin tzarek lahavin. One more thing the Rebbe says we have to understand. Medivri Rashi. Rashi brings down the hub betel habe'er kashur lamisas meisha. Where Rashi says, <clears throat> this is where the Be'er, in our Parsha, this is where the Be'er seized. He, the Rashi says, this is where Moshe died. This is where Moshe passed. This is where the Be'er seized. So we see that the Be'er has a Shaykh to Moshe. Mashma. Shenokat. It's, it's, it's understood from what Rashi said. Shechazoriz ha-Be'er ha-Yisab es-Chus Moshe. That the return of the Be'er was in the Shus of Moshe. Vim came. Madu'a loy chazru gama nanea kawai b'Shus Moshe. So if already you're going to have the return of a miracle in the Shkos of Moshe, why not both? Why not also the honor guards? And this is where the Sikha goes from being simply fascinating on, on, you know, on, on an intellectual level to being downright poignant. The Rebbe says, Al Pipshudashul Mikra, that when we say that the Jews got the man in honor of Moshe, it's different. What they got from Moshe was different from what they got from Aaron and Miriam. Because in the cases of Aaron and Miriam, they got it in their schus. But what they got from Moshe, she Moshe roya neman, because Moshe was their faithful shepherd, da'ag livnei Yisrael l'chol ha-nitzrach lahem u-be'eshe nitzchul l'kach. He worried for everything that the Jews, for all their necessities, and he worried that they get it in the time that they needed them. And from this, this is further sweetened, this whole study. On Urayim, we see 
this idea that Moshe worried for their necessities, this is a whole different category. This is not like something that they got in the schos of somebody. So when that person passes, they lose it. It's a whole different category. And therefore, even after Moshe passes, either if they don't have something, it's because they don't need it, or he continues to give it to them after he passes. Even though after Moshe passed, Rashi tells us that the Be'er was no longer. At that point, they simply did not need it anymore because they were right there at the precipice of the Yardin. And in like fashion, for the man, perish Rashi Le'il. Rashi tells us earlier, even though when Moshe passed on Zion Adar, the man stopped to come down. But still the Jews had an ample supply of man afterwards. Why? Why? So much mud came down on that last day that it was enough for them until they brought the carbon Omer on the 16th day of Nisan. We all understand what the Rebbe is telling us. That he gave us enough mud to last us. Rifki. Yeah. It's backwards. It seems backwards. When you, sorry, when you do, when something happens b'schos somebody, it remains even after they go. When something is done by somebody for you, it can only remain while that person is alive. That's mm-hmm. only b'das tafte. That's only in our normal paradigm, in our limited understanding, you're right. But what the Rebbe is telling us is that our Chachamim told us that this was B'schos Aaron. And what you're saying that B'schos remains, this is all on a spiritual level, B'schos and remain, right? But B'pepoyal Mamash, it, it, it didn't operate. After Moshe passed, the Be'er ceased to operate. He was able to bring back the B'schos of Miriam, but it needed a next B'schos. But what the Rebbe is pointing out is that a Nasi Hadar, he's soon going to say it more explicitly, that Moshe being the Raya Neman, it stays. When he left, he left them with enough mud. Right. Ches, the Rebbe is going to say this now more explicitly. Limut From this, we have a teaching for the idea of a Nasi Yisrael in every generation. Even after they rise upwards. That to the naked eye, it seems that their hashva is not overtly seen. At face value, it seemed that after Moshe passed, the man stopped coming down. He ne klal meforsam hu, but it's a well-known um, klal, a, 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 a rule, asher lo yifradu, lo yiparedu me'al tzayim marisam. And these are words of the Freyitik Rebbe that he wrote about his father, the Rebbe Rashab. He wrote it, look at footnote 68, liyot harishan So the Fitz Rebbe wrote these words about his father, the Rebbe Rashab, on the first of his yard site. He wrote that a Nasi Yisrael will not part from the sheep in his flock. 
And not only like it says in Gemara Saita that he could still stand above and serve. This is not something we could see with, with our eyes. It's because the Pu'ulis, all of the overtures, all everything that was put into effect by a Nasi Yisrael continues to operate. It's a Pu'ula Nimshechas. She mistap gimehem gam achar istalkusum mina ilamazen. And we are able to be satisfied. We are able to, our needs are satisfied through these overtures that continue after they alight from this world. And this is also connected, so it's a special connection to the Chag HaGaul of Yud Beis Yud that very often, including this year, the year that the Sicha was given, and including our year, that Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamos comes after Parshas Chukas. And we know, the Rebbe teaches us over and over, that the days of the coming week, they are blessed, they they, they draw their sukkah and their blessing from the Shabbos before. The Rebbe says, we could see so clearly this idea in the Geula of our Nasi. This is a reference to Basic Gimel Tamas to, to the Fritzke we saw clearly that the Geula of Yudbezi Gimel Tamas brought to the strengthening of Torah and the um, <clears throat> and the spreading of of Judaism. Even in that terrible uh, territory, the Medina, he in Russia, who Paulan and Shechis Adayemeze, the Rebbe says, we see that it continues until this day. Ukvar Hamid Gimel Dershel Yehudim Shemeter and Mrs. Medina, he. And could you imagine, the Rebbe says, under those circumstances where they tried to purge that territory? of God, so to speak, right? In godless Russia, you already have three generations of God-fearing Jews. And the Torah tells us that when you have three generations, then the Torah paskins that the terror will never be removed from the mouth of your, your mouth, your children's mouth, your grandchildren's mouth from now until forever. This is a passage from Yeshayah. Via Seremizu, and even more. We see even that so many of our compatriots of, 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 of B'nai Yisrael, our brothers, that were seemingly cut off They were cut off from Torah and Judaism for a number of generations. And it was only because of the dreadful, the awesomely dreadful um, uh, situation, um, but the Tanayim are the, 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 the Help me here, somebody. Tanayim are um, the circumstances, we'll say now. And we see conditions, mistap, conditions thank you. Mistapkim ata yamazemit pula hagula. Until this very day, the Rebbe says, the return of these Jews who were cut off from Yiddishkeit for a couple of generations, it is from the sukkah. They are, they are still deriving their sustenance. He's still arousing them to come to Tshuva and to bring them back to Torah. 
ועל ידי הסאסקוס כדבוי בכולס חג הגאולה. And through our engagement, our proper engagement, with what the Baal HaGa'ula, the Chag HaGa'ula wanted from us, L'chazik Ter B'yadus L'hafitzam, to strengthen Torah and to spread it, the promulgation of Torah, K'ela L'b'frat Inish Hazman, Grama HaFatzis Ma'ayanis HaChasidus, including and especially what is most necessary for now, the spreading of the wellsprings of Chasidus, Chutza, to all places, Azai Ka'asimar, then, Mashiach will come, the mister will come. Da Malka Mashiach, this is Mashiach, Kenu, Bimheira, via Menu, Amen. It should be taken from a yad in our days, speedily in our days. Amen. And uh, we, we could see, I mean, and this, all the Rebbe is attributing everything, of course, to his father in law, um, but I think that it's clear to all of us who are living today how. The Rebbe is Poyel Yeshua's Beker of Ha'aretz. And um, we were just at a wedding last night. I can't even tell you how many people told me that their rabbi just spoke about Gimel Tamos from the pulpit on Shabbos. All like modern Orthodox and, and some conservative temples. Just mind-blowing what we're seeing, what, what, what's happening. So they just show us that we was yeah. it an alumnus's wedding of yours, a, a from kosher wedding that you influenced that because of you, you're at their wedding and they're continuing a generation of from kids? So not, 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 <laughs> because, of us, not because of us, because That's of the forever. Rebbe. Um, right. it, it, it was actually a special nachas because awesome. um, it was children of two alumni who met in Binghamton. That's... And 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 got married, and we made Shabbat brachas for them, Baruch Hashem. And now their daughter got married. Whatnot. It was very all. It was it was crazy being up to that's it. It's like it says in the sicha, generation after generation, <laughs> three generations later. You know. Yeah. So the two kids that got married were were Binghamton kids. Oh, the bride's parents both went to Binghamton. The groom's mother went to Binghamton. The band leaders. Wife went to Binghamton. Um, the lead singer's sister went to Binghamton. I'm going to stop right now, but it gets more crazy. Um, yeah, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. I I will tell you. I was I wasn't going to mention this. I will tell you that when I came into the wedding, uh, somebody very close to the bridal party uh, said to me, um, "You know, it was just Gimel Tamos, but you want to see Gimel Tamos? You want to see the Rebbe? Look at this wedding." Yeah, that's what she said to me. Right. I wasn't going to say this, even though it was in my mind. But sorry, you. Uh... <laughs> Ricky, we were at a wedding of alumni also last night. The girl, oh, yeah. the girl is our alumnus, and it was such a beautiful wedding. It was. She, I mean, she, she didn't meet her. You know, she didn't meet him at Chabad House, but to see how what she looked like when she came in, versus what she looked like last night. Was the Abisha should help. We should have citizen nachas from each one of our mm-hmm. students, and we should very, very take it from Yad be able to tell the Rebbe, I mean, it's enough already. Yeah. And, and, and Sarah, I'll just say one last thing cross pollination here. So you remember we had a student that went on a trip and she met one of your students and they got married. Yeah, Elle met Scott. Scott. I don't and, yeah, and now, and now, where they live in New Jersey, a new shliach just went out, and they became involved. So this is what the Rebbe wanted: connect the dots. It's a big yeah, game so of connect the dots. We got next keep- month, next month, we have my husband's doing a wedding for a student who went to Binghamton undergrad. Knew you went to your Chabad house, came to Ohio State, continued going to our Chabad house, met his kala at our Chabad house and they are- What's his name? Zach Tuchfeld. I don't know if you remember Oh him. my gosh. Yeah. That's amazing. That's, and they're everything kosher. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Mamash amazing. I'm learning Tarsim Shpacha with her and- Amazing. Yeah. And Zalman Amazing. Amazing. So I was talking to the photographer and the <laughs> photographer told me last night, 